Section six of Astounding Stories twelve, december nineteen thirty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pirate Planet by Charles W. Diffin. Part B. Chapter ten. Two men grinned in derision at the horrible man shaped thing that held their destinies in his lean, inhuman hands. But they turned abruptly away to look again above them where that bright star still shone through an opening in the clouds. The earth. Home. It seemed as if they could never tear their eyes away from the sight. Their captor whistled an order, and the guard of four tugged vainly at the two who resisted that they might gaze upon their own world until the closing clouds should blot it from sight. A cry from one of the red guards roused them. The dark was closing in fast, and their surroundings were dim. Vaguely, McGuire felt, more than saw, one of the red figures whirled into the air. He sensed a movement in the jungle darkness where were groves of weird trees and the tangle of huge vegetable growths. What it was he could not say, but he felt the guard who clutched at him quiver in terror. Their leader snatched at the instrument that hung about his neck and put it to his lips. He whistled an order, sharp and shrill. Blazing light that seemed to flame in the air was the response. The air was aglow with an all-pervading brilliance, like that in the car that had whirled them from the landing field. The light was everywhere, and the building before them was surrounded by a dazzling envelope of luminosity. Whatever of motion or menace there had been ceased abruptly. Their guard, three now in number instead of four, seized them roughly and hustled them toward an open door. No time as they passed for more than fleeting impressions. A hall of warm, glowing light, a passage that branched off, and at the end a room into which they were thrown, while a metal door clanged behind them. These were no gentle hands that hurled the men staggering through the doorway, and Professor Sykes fell headlong upon the glassy floor. He sprang to his feet, his face aflame with anger. The miserable beasts, he shouted. Take it easy, admonished the flyer. We're in the Hooskow. No use of getting all fussed up if they don't behave like perfect gentlemen. There's a bunk in the corner, he said, and pointed to a woven hammock that was covered with soft cloths. And here's another that I can sling. Twin beds. What more do you want? He opened a door, and the splash of falling water came to them. A fountain cascaded to the ceiling to fall splashing upon a floor of inlaid glassy tile. McGuire whistled. Room and bath, he said and you complained of the service. I have an idea, he told the scientist, that our scarlet friend, who owns this place, intends to treat us decently, even though his helpers are a bit rough. My hunch is that he wants to get some information out of us. That old bird back there in the council chamber told me as plain as day that they think they are going to conquer the earth. Maybe that's why we are here, as exhibits A and B, for them to study and learn how to lick us. "'You are talking what I would have termed nonsense a month ago,' replied Sykes. "'But now, well, I am afraid you are right. "'And,' he said slowly, "'I fear that they are equally correct. "'They have conquered space. "'They have ships propelled by some unknown power. "'They have gas weapons, as you and I have reason to know. "'And they have all the beastly ferocity "'to carry such a plan through to success. "'But I wonder what that sky-splitting blast meant.' "'Bombardment,' the flyer told him bombardment of the earth as sure as you're alive. More nonsense, said Sykes, and probably correct. Well, what are we to do? Sit tight and give them as little information as we can, or— His question ended unfinished. The alternative, it seemed, was not plain to him. There's only one answer, said McGuire. We must get away. Escape somehow. Professor Sykes' eyes showed his appreciation of a spirit that could still dare to hope, but he asked, dejectedly, "'Escape? Good idea. But where to?' "'I have an idea,' the flyer said slowly. "'An idea about an island.' He told the professor what he had observed, the fact that there was one spot of land on this globe from which the traffic of these monsters of Venus steered clear. This, he explained, must have some significance. "'Whatever is there—' God only knows, he admitted, but it is something these devils don't like a little bit. It might be interesting to learn more. We'll make a break for it. Find a boat. No, we probably can't do it, but we can make a try. Now what is our first step, I wonder? Our first step, 
said Professor Sykes, measuring his words, as if he might be working out some astronomical calculation, is into the inverted shower-bath, if you feel as hot as I do. And our next step, when all is quiet for the night, is through the window I see beyond. I can see the branches of one of those undernourished trees from here. "'Last one in is a lop-eared Venusian,' said McGuire, throwing off his jacket. And in that strange room, in a strange world, under the shadow of death and of tortures unknown, the two men stripped with all the carefree abandon of a couple of schoolboys racing to be first in the old swimming hole. It was some time later when the door opened and a long red hand pushed a tray of food into the room. The tray was of unbreakable crystal. He rattled it heedlessly upon the floor, and it held crystal dishes of unknown foods. They were sampling them all when Sykes remarked plaintively, I would like to know what under heaven I am eating. I wish to know that in lots of restaurants, McGuire replied. I remember a place down on— He stopped abruptly, then chewed in silence upon a fruit like a striped pepper that stung his mouth and tongue while he scarcely felt it. References to earth things plainly were to be avoided. The visions they brought before one's eyes were unnerving. They made a pretense of sleeping in case they were being observed, and it was some hours later when the two stood quietly beside the open window. As Sykes had seen, there were branches of a pale, twisted tree growth close outside. McGuire tried his weight upon them, then swung himself out, hand over hand, upon the branch that bent low beneath him. Sykes was close behind when he clambered to the ground to stand for some minutes, listening silently in the dark. "'Too easy,' the lieutenant whispered. "'They are too foxy to leave a gateway like that, but here we are.' The shore is off in this direction. The dark of a night unrelieved by a single star was about them as they moved noiselessly away. They followed open ground at first. The building that had been their brief prison was upon their right. Beyond and at the left was where the ship landed. It was gone now. And beyond that the wall of vegetation. And again in the dark McGuire had an uncanny sense of motion. Soft bodies were slipping quietly one upon another. Something that lived was there beyond them in the night. No sound or sign of life came from the house. No guard had been posted. And McGuire stopped again, before plunging into the tangled growth to whisper, "'Too easy, Sykes. There's something about this.' He had pushed aside the fronds of a giant fern. A cautious step beyond his hands touched a slippery, pliant vine, and his whisper ended as he felt the thing turn and twist beneath his hand. It was alive, writhing cold as the body of a monster snake, and just as vicious and savage in the way that it whipped down and about him in the gloom of the starless night. The thing was alive. It threw its coils around his body in an embrace that left him breathless. A slender tendril was tightening about his neck. His hands and arms were bound. His ankle was grasped as he was whirled aloft, a human hand that gripped him this time and Sykes, forgetting discretion and the need for silence, was shouting in the darkness that gave no clue to their opponent. "'Hang on!' he yelled. "'I've got you, Mac!' His shouts were cut short by another serpent shape that thrashed him and smashed the softer, growing things to earth that it might wrap this man, too, in its deadly coils. McGuire felt his companion's hold loosen as he was lifted from the ground. There were other arms flailing about him, living, coiling things that seemed to fight one with another for this prize. Abruptly, blindingly, the scene was vividly etched before him. The strange trees, the ferns, the writhing and darting serpent arms, they were illumined in a dazzling white light. He was in the air, clutched strangely in constricting arms. An odor of rotted flesh was in his nostrils, sickening, suffocating. Beyond and almost beneath him a cauldron of green gaped open, and he saw within it a pool of thick liquid that eddied and steamed to give off the stench of putrescence. All this in an instant of vision, and in that instant he knew the death they courted. It was a giant pod that held that pool, one of the growths he had seen ranged out like a line of sentinels. But the terrible tendrils that had been coiled and at rest were wrapped about him now drawing him to that reeking pool of death and the waiting thick lips that would close above him. Sykes, too, the tendrils that had clutched him, were whisking his helpless body where another gaping mouth was open. 
And then, in the blazing light that was more brilliant than any light of day in this world, the hold about McGuire relaxed. He saw, as he fell, the thick green lips snap shut, and the arms that had held him pulled back into harmless, tight-wound coils. Their bodies crashed to earth where a great fern bent beneath them to cushion their fall, and the men lay silent and gasping for great choking breaths, while from the building beyond came the cackle and shrieking of man-things in manifest enjoyment of the frustrated plans. It was the laughter that determined McGuire. "'Damn the plants,' he said between hoarse breaths. "'Man-eating plants, but they're better than those devils. And there's only one line of them. I saw them here before. Shall we go on, make a break for it?' Sykes rolled to the shelter of an arching frond, and without a word went crawling away. McGuire was behind him, and the two, as they came to open ground, sprang to their feet and ran on through the weird orchard, where tree-trunks made dim, twisting lines. They ran blindly and helplessly toward the outer dark that promised temporary shelter. A hopeless attempt. Both men knew the futility of it while they stumbled onward through the dark. Behind them the night was hideous with noise as the great palace gave forth an eruption of shrieking inhuman forms that scattered with whistling and wailing calls in all directions, a mile or more of groping hopeless flight, till a yellow gleam shone among the trees to guide them. A building, beyond a clearing, gave a bright illumination to the black night. "'We've run in a circle,' choked McGuire, his voice weak and uncertain with exhaustion, like a couple of fools. He waited until the heavy breathing that shook his body might be controlled, then corrected himself. No. This is another, a new one. See the towers? And listen. It's a radio station. The slender frameworks that towered high in the air glowed like flame, a warning to the ships whose lights showed now and then far overhead, and, clear and distinct, there came to the listening men the steady, crackling hiss of an uninterrupted signal. Against the lighted building, Moving figures showed momentarily, and McGuire pulled his friend into the safe concealment of a tangle of growth, while the group of yelling things sped past. "'Come on,' he told Sykes. "'We can't get away, not a chance. Let's have a look at this place, and perhaps—well, I have an idea.' He slipped silently, cautiously on, where a forest of jungle ferns gave promise of safe passage. Some warning had been sounded. The occupants of the building were scattered to aid in the manhunt. Only one was left in the room where two earthmen peeped in at the door. The figure was seated upon an insulated platform, and his long hands manipulated keys and levers on a table before him. McGuire and Sykes stared amazedly at this broadcasting station, whose air was filled with a pandemonium of crashing sound from some distant room but McGuire was concerned mainly with the motion of a lean, blood-red hand that swung an object like a pointer in free-running sweeps above a dial on the table, and he detected a variation in the din from beyond as the pointer moved swiftly. Here was the control board for those messages he had heard. This was the instrument that varied the sending mechanism to produce the wailing, wireless cries that made words in some far-distant ears. McGuire, as he slipped into the room and crept within leaping distance of the grotesque thing, so like yet unlike a man, was as silent as the nameless writhing horror that had seized them in the dark. He sprang, and the two came crashing to the floor. Lean arms came quickly about him to clutch and tear at his face, but the flyer had an arm free, and one blow ended the battle. The man of Venus relaxed to a huddle of purple and yellow cloth from which a ghastly face protruded. McGuire leaped to his feet and sprang to the place where the other had been. "'Hold them off as long as you can,' he shouted to Sykes, and his hand closed upon the pointer. Did this station send where he was hoping? Was this the station that had communicated with the ship that had hovered above their flying field in that far-off land? He did not know, but it was a powerful station, and there was a chance." He moved the pointer frantically here and there, swung it to one side and another, then found at last a point on the outside of the strange design beneath his hand, where the pointer could rest while the crashing crackle of sound was stilled. And now he swung the pointer, upon the plate, anywhere, and the noise from beyond told instantly of the current's passage. He held it an instant, then pushed it back to the silent spot. A dash! 
a quick return that flashed back again to bring silence. A dot. More dashes and dots, and McGuire thanked a kindly heaven that had permitted him to learn the language of the air, while he cursed his slowness in sending. Would it reach? Would there be anyone to hear? No certainty. He could only flash the wild Morse symbols out into the night. He must try to get word to them, warn them. And Blake, he called, and spelled out the name of their field. Warning, Venus. Hold them, he yelled to Sykes at the sound of rushing feet. Keep them off as long as you can. Prepare for invasion. Blake, this is McGuire. Over and over he worked the swinging pointer into symbols that might in some way, by some fortunate chance, help that helpless people to resist the horror that lay ahead. And while heavy bodies crashed against the door that Sykes was holding, there came from some deep hidden well of memory and inspiration. There was a man he had once met, a man who had confided wondrous things, and now, with the knowledge of these others who had conquered space, he could believe wholly what he had laughed and joked about before. That man, too, had claimed to have traveled far from the earth. He had invented a machine. His name? The pointer was swinging in frenzied haste, to spell over and over the name of a man, and the name, too, of a forgotten place in the mountains of Nevada. It was repeating the message, then finished in one long crashing wail as a cloud of vapor shot about McGuire, and his hand upon the pointer went suddenly limp. End of chapter 10